Section 1.3, Properties of Matter. Each substance has a unique set of physical and chemical properties. And you have to be able to tell the difference between them. Um, I'll just go ahead and tell you first, chemical properties are just, will it react with something? A chemical property, does it react with, does it burn in air? Or does it react with, with acids or something like that so a that's pretty easy a chemical property describes how a substance reacts or changes from one form in uh, to form something new so like um, something is burning in air burning in oxygen a physical property is anything that's measured without changing the substance so like um, its density or its smell or its color its melting point, um, its elect electrical conductivity, something that you can you can describe without changing it into something new. Uh, as long as it's what it is, if it's st still what it is, then it's a physical property. Uh, these properties can also be categorized, categorized as intensive or extensive. And uh, year after year, this is a problem because it's not something that's in any way in your vocabulary, an intensive property or an extensive property. So extensive gives you this idea of extending. Um, it's extending to all of the stuff. Maybe that's the only way I can say. So if you have extensive properties, it depends on how much you have. All right, so three logs on the fire will produce more heat than one log on the fire. Okay, because that is based upon how much you use. Okay, so um, anything like, like volume. Volume would be based on how much or mass. How much? How much do you have? Um, intensive properties don't depend upon the amount. So it's temperature. So one gallon can have a temperature and a hundred gallons could have that same temperature. Or it's melting point or something, something that doesn't depend upon the amount. All right. So intensive properties give an idea of the composition of a substance. So... Um, Extensive properties give an idea of, of how much is there, so the quantity of it. So if you know that I'm giving getting X amount of um, temperature out of the fuel that I'm burning, then that's giving me an idea of how much of the fuel that I had. So intensive um, doesn't depend upon the amount. Extensive extends to all of it, so it does depend on the amount. If you, if you take something and it's still the same stuff at the end of whatever you've done, it's a physical change. So if you take a rock and you hit it with a hammer and it breaks into two small rocks, you haven't changed its chemical composition. It's still the same stuff. Then it's a physical change. Or if you, say, do a change of state such as melting something. You had you had solid chocolate bunny and then you put it in your pocket and now it's a liquid chocolate bunny. It's still the same stuff. It might not look like a bunny anymore, but it hasn't changed its, its properties. Everything about it is still the same. So it, it hasn't altered its identity at all. So changes of state would be physical change. Um, breaking into small parts would be physical change. A chemical change is also called a chemical reaction. And we are going to live in that idea. We're going to do a billion different chemical reactions. Something turning into something new. So a substance is transforming into a completely different substance. So its identity changes. So if you take hydrogen gas and oxygen gas and you put it together in such a way that they will actually unite chemically, then you have a huge explosion and it produces water. 
So this is an example of a chemical change. So nitric acid on copper produces nitrous oxide, which is nice and poisonous. And then the copper turns into a copper solution. And you can see that with the green color. So there's a solution of copper and the, cop and the penny is actually corroding or being eaten away. If you want to separate mixtures, um, there are several different separation techniques that um, are exploiting the differences in the properties of the components. So this first one is called filtration, and you've got a solid um, and a liquid mixture. So if you can pass the liquid, which is very small, through tiny little holes, say in paper or in some other kind of, there's all kinds of different kind of um, filtration, but uh, like this is just a piece of filter paper and the, the holes in the paper are small enough for the water to get through, but not small enough for the molecules dissolved in the water. So you will separate a solid from a, from a liquid with filtration. The second one is a, um, is a, um, distillation. So this is a still. So this is how you would make moonshine. Essentially you're going to have some kind of a boiling flask and then from that from those vapors you're exploiting the difference in boiling point. So if you have a mixture, um, let's say moonshine, you, you mix some corn and you uh, essentially have a corn mash and then you end up with some with some mixture of some alcohol because microorganisms will turn without oxygen if, if it's anaerobic the only way that they can make energy is through glycolysis and glycolysis is anaerobic um, you'll learn this in biology I think but in any case you um, if plants will make alcohol if there's no oxygen to use to generate sugar you will make uh, lactic acid, and that's why you're sore after exercise. If you don't have enough oxygen in your cells, you will make lactic acid. A plant, if they don't have enough oxygen and they're making sugar, then they'll make alcohol. Well, you have a mixture of alcohol, some kind of plant plus water plus alcohol. You just boil it, and alcohol boils at 60 degrees and water boils at 100 and so it goes down through the condenser, it just cools, and then it separates into a receiving flask. So that's a distillation. So you're boiling off one and one or more components of the mixture in order. That's how they separate, say, gasoline from kerosene, because there, there's different, uh, different points at which they would boil off or, or uh, vaporize somehow. Then the last one um, from this section is chromatography. And chroma is uh, Greek for color, and uh, graph means to write. So essentially writing with color, I think, is the idea. It's exploiting the different abilities for substances to adhere to surfaces of solids. So um, if you absorb something, the the smallest of the molecules will go farther. So like you're wiping up the kitchen counter with a paper towel, the teeniest uh, component of that stuff that you're soaking up into the paper towel will go further up into the paper than the bigger stuff. So the bigger stuff doesn't travel as far, the smaller stuff travels farther. And so this is a picture of just a piece of ink, a black dot of ink like a, a permanent marker or something, and then some kind of a some kind of a solution that's being wicked up through the paper. I think this is just filter paper, and it's either water or some kind of an alcohol or um, I usually use a fingernail polish remover, and it goes up and it separates the inks, all the different colors because black ink is just made up of of the different colors of ink. And each of those different colors is a different molecule, and those different molecules have different heavinesses, and the lighter ones will travel farther, and the heavier ones won't. So that's chromatography. There's all kinds of different kinds of chromatography, uh, even gas chromatography, which is really, really cool. But in any case, that's separating mixtures. 
the last section and uh, the last part of this section um, I've actually already described, and that's the scientific method. If you remember, the scientific method is a it's a guideline for the practice of science, and to where you're collecting data by uh, observation and experiments. You're looking for patterns. Uh, you're trying to explain what you see by hypothesis, something that you uh, it's a tentative type of explanation, and then you test a hypothesis by um, some type of an experiment, trying to prove it wrong, and then you keep trying to prove it wrong, keep trying to prove it wrong, and if nobody can prove it wrong, then it, you might be onto something, and then you eventually can bring it together into some kind of a of, of a theory that describes uh, something um, that that is supported, and eventually into some kind of a scientific law. Um, so the theory should should explain the general principles and even make predictions of it. But I've already given you picture with a flowchart and all that, so do that for I think one section one.